Hello everyone and welcome to the first of many educational webinars hosted by Euroimmune US. Thank you so much for making time today and join us for this very interesting webinar. Today we are going to talk about Lyme disease and the current status of knowledge. My name is Dr. Oliver Senscheid. I'm the Scientific Affairs Director for Euroimmune US, a world leading provider of medical diagnostic solutions. And it is with a particular pleasure that I introduce our today's speaker for this very, very interesting webinar, Dr. Amin Ali Dini, a worldwide renowned scientist researcher in the field of inflammatory diseases, who currently holds a position <clears throat> as an assistant professor at the Columbia University in New York City. He's focusing on a number of aspects. The first one is the identification of biomarkers um, helping to stage Lyme disease. He's also interested in exploring mechanisms and biomarkers of post-infection persistence of inflammation and symptoms in Lyme disease, hence his expertise in this very topic. Also, he studies the inflammatory response to dietary and micro microbial mole molecules in the context of gastrointestinal neuropsychiatric diseases, hence studying the uh, gut immune brain connection. He started his scientific career as a PhD student at the University of Cincinnati and then moved on for a postdoctoral fellowship to the University of Cornell. He received multiple honors and awards, including two very prestigious ones from the uh, Department of Defense. And in his career so far, he has published more than 50 high-impact peer-reviewed publications uh, with a lot of highly reputed uh, journals. Um, with this, I would like to hand it over to our speaker for today, Dr. Amin Aledini. Thank you so much for joining and thank you so much for speaking about Lyme disease today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stenshaw. It's a pleasure Stenshine. to be with you, and uh, I'd like to thank the uh, participants for uh, for joining. So I would like to start by uh, talking a little bit about the history of Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme, of course, has been around for a very, very long time, but uh, we've basically identified Lyme disease as an infection and known about the causative agent uh, very recently. So it was discovered in the 19, uh, 1970s in uh, Old Lyme, Connecticut, Connecticut, hence the name Lyme disease. It was actually originally mistaken as a type of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It was initially thought to perhaps be due to uh, uh, a viral infection. It was predominant in, in children uh, near uh, Lyme, and uh, most of these children, of course, had a history of uh, playing near the woods and also a history of tick bites. The connection between tick bite and the, the causative agent that turned out to be a bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi uh, was made in the early 80s uh, by a scientist named uh, Willie Burgdorfer. And so Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, the name comes from that. So uh, Borrelia refers to a group of gram-negative bacteria of the family Spirochetitia. Uh, there are at least 36 different genus species of Borrelia. Now, the ones that are pathogenic in the context of Lyme disease are referred to as Borrelia burgdorferi sensilata. In Europe and in the US, the species of Borrelia that cause Lyme disease are different. In Europe, uh, Lyme disease is primarily caused by Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, Borrelia uh, gorinii, Borrelia afzelii, and also to a uh, smaller extent, Borrelia filmani. In the U.S., Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, which means sort of Borrelia burgdorferi in the, in the strict sense, has been the sole uh, pathogenic uh, or causative agent of Lyme disease. But recently, a, a new <clears throat> Borrelia was discovered at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, it's been named Borrelia mayonii. We don't know exactly what uh, the uh, 
frequency of uh, or um, how, how many Lyme patients may have Borrelia meonia yet, but it is believed to be fairly small compared to what we know about uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. More work is, of course, being done on that. So uh, Lyme disease is, of course, uh, a vector-borne infection. And in fact, it is the most common vector-borne infection in both uh, Europe and the United States. The transmission is by black-legged ticks uh, that are called Ixodes ricinus complex. Um, in the U.S., uh, uh, for example, we have Ixodes scapularis and Ixodes pacificus. In Europe, we have other ones, but the complex is called Ixodes ricinus. There are three developmental stages in these ticks, the larva, nymph, and adult. And the whole life cycle of the tick is approximately three years. And there are three blood feedings that are necessary for this cycle before every mold and egg deposition. The transmission of Borrelia by these ticks can happen uh, in any developmental stage, really, but it is most frequently during the nymph stage. So in terms of the distribution of uh, Lyme disease throughout the world, as you can see in this map, it is pretty much uh, limited to the uh, northern hemisphere. And um, basically, I don't know if you can see my uh, pointer here, where it is most common is around this, around this um, latitude right here. So if you go further north where it's colder, it becomes less, and if you go down, it becomes also less frequent. The distribution of Lyme in the United States is also very geographically uh, isolated. So, for example, you can, you can see here in the U.S., you have the Northeast and certain parts of the Midwest having the highest, highest frequency of Lyme disease. Um, mostly in the Northeast, mostly in the New England and the Mid-Atlantic regions. Of course, it has been reported in many states, but this is predominantly in these areas. Now, there have been estimates of uh, how prevalent Lyme disease is, in fact, in the United States. The, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has conducted two studies in just the very uh, last few years uh, to know how many people might actually really be diagnosed with Lyme disease each year. Uh, one of these was published in 2014, and it was based basically on the number of uh, Lyme diagnoses that were uh, made based on laboratory specimens that went into diagnostic laboratories. And based on that, an estimation of 288,000, close to 300,000 was made for Lyme disease infections in the United States. A newer study, which came out about a year and a half ago, uh, showed that this was, by the way, based on health insurance claims, uh, made a very similar estimate, 329 cases, uh, 329,000 cases of Lyme disease occurring annually in the United States. So uh, we can say that there is at least 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease based on these data occurring in the United States each year. Now, Lyme disease occurs in different stages, and each stage has a different set of symptoms associated with it. And the very early part of Lyme disease occurs in basically in days. It's the what we call early localized Lyme disease. It begins at the site of the tick bite, and it is typically associated with a, a characteristic skin lesion that is known as erythema migrans, or EM, as you can see here. It's, this doesn't show it very well. I don't know if you can see, but it looks like a bullseye. Uh, now, this is, this is what you see most of the time, but, but there are other shapes of it, too. So, it, 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 you know, the, it, it couldn't, it's not necessarily round. Now, early disseminated disease occurs days or weeks after the tick bite, when the bacteria have basically spread through the blood, and that's associated with multiple skin lesions, multiple EM lesions, as well as extracutaneous manifestations 
particularly acute carditis and neurologic involvement. For example, you can see here a uh, child with facial palsy. Uh, much less common is what's called lymphocytoma. This is, does not happen in the U.S., uh, but it has been recorded in Europe and Asia. Now, late disease occurs months to basically years after uh, the original exposure and can present as arthritis, late neuroborreliosis, or acrodermatitis chronica and trophicans. Now, ACA is, again, not recorded in the United States. It's uh, been found only in Europe and Asia. Here you can see, based on the uh, CDC data, uh, the basically different manifestations of Lyme disease and how uh, prevalent they are. As you can see, most uh, individuals present with the EM rash, the erythema migrans. That's the earliest. Uh, after that, the most common is uh, Lyme arthritis, and that's followed by the neurologic manifestations of Lyme disease. Uh, the cardiac manifestations are fairly rare, as you can see here. Now, the diagnosis of Lyme disease is clinical. However, it is currently aided by laboratory testing. So laboratory testing is a major component of the diagnosis for Lyme disease. However, it remains a clinical diagnosis. That is, laboratory testing by itself is not valuable and by itself is not valuable in diagnosing Lyme disease. In terms of laboratory tests for Lyme disease, it can be roughly divided into two types. The ones that, where you have direct detection of the organism and the second is basically looking for changes in the body in response to the organism. And those are basically immunologic changes in response to the organism. As far as the direct detection methods go, the most common are uh, microscopy and culture, as well as genetic testing, basically looking for the organism's genes in the body. And that's done by PCR. The issue with detect, uh, detection using direct methods is that the sensitivity is, is uh, pretty low. Uh, it also can be time-consuming, and it's not uh, necessarily standardized yet. But the most important uh, shortcoming is that it doesn't have the sensitivity that is required. Part of the reason for that is that uh, in Lyme disease, the number of organisms in the body don't have to be high to make you sick. And that's why, unlike a lot of other infections, you can't detect the organisms that easily. And that's why serologic tests remain the most common and most widely used tests for, uh, for basically screening for Lyme disease. Uh, these techniques are immune-based, and there are different types. For example, there is ELISA, which stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. There is immunoblotting. There is immunofluorescent assay. Uh, or IFA. IFA is not that common, so the most commonly used techniques are ELISA and immunoblot, also called Western blot. Now you can see the sensitivity of uh, these serologic techniques uh, based on these immunoassays during the different stages of Lyme disease in this table. Um, for example, in localized and early disseminated that is associated with either single or multiple EM lesions, the sensitivity ranges uh, from 20 to 60 percent, look, depending on the study. And during that time, uh, what we look for is IgM antibodies primarily, but also IgG antibodies increasingly, especially to a uh, IgG antibodies, the particular molecule of Borrelia, which I will be talking about in more detail later. During the early disseminated, for example, in early neurologic Lyme disease, um, the sensitivity, of course, is much higher. It you know, has ranged between 70 and 90 percent, and the de detection is usually uh, by uh, looking for IgG and IgM antibodies to Borrelia. And finally, late Lyme disease, which uh, is made up of uh, primarily of late neurologic Lyme and late arthritis, 
the sensitivity is 90 to 100 percent. Almost all individuals do have a pretty robust antibody response during this late uh, phase of Lyme disease, and normally we would detect only IgG antibodies during this stage. Now, several years ago, it was uh, in the 90s that the uh, Centers for Disease Control came up with a, an algorithm for, for testing for Lyme disease. And this has been referred to as the two-tiered testing algorithm for Lyme. And it starts with a first test followed, if positive, by a second test. The first test is either an enzyme immunoassay or an immunofluorescence assay. As I mentioned, immunofluorescence assays are really not in much use anymore. So the first test is now generally an ELISA. If it is positive or if it's borderline positive, then the patient gets tested by the Western blot. Uh, and if the signs or symptoms have been around for less than 30 days or approximately 30 days, both IgG and IgM Western blot are done, whereas this, if the symptoms and signs are greater than approximately 30 days, and that can range from four weeks to six weeks, for example, uh, then IgG Western blot is only done. The IgM is not done. Now, the, as I mentioned, the CDC recommends now the, the two-tier strategy uh, since the, the, the 90s. And it does not, the strategy does not recommend skipping the uh, screening uh, ELISA test. It doesn't recommend going directly to the Western blot without doing uh, the uh, ELISA because that can increase the uh, false positive rate. Uh, the immunoblot basically should not be run if the ELISA tests are negative, in other words. Now, during the first four weeks of disease onset, both IgG and IgM blots should be used, as I mentioned earlier, and IgM alone uh, for screening or uh, confirming should not be relied upon. Both classes should always be tested to ensure proper results. A positive IgM uh, Western blot is only meaningful during that first four to six weeks of illness. Otherwise, uh, false positive rates are high. And if the patient has been ill for longer than four to six weeks and the IgG in the blot test is negative, it is unlikely that the patient has Lyme disease, even if the IgM immunoblot is positive. This is, again, according to the CDC two-tier testing algorithm. Uh, the CDC recognize a, recognizes a positive IgM Western blot or immunoblot result if two of these three bands are present, a 25 kilodalton band, which is uh, which is basically the OSP-C protein, a 39 kilodalton band, and a 41 kilodalton band, which is the flagellin protein. For the IgG, the CDC recognizes a positive result if five of the following 10 bands are present, and those 10 are the 18, 21, 28, 30, 39, 41, 45, 58, 66, and 93 kilodalton bands. Note that Notice that the 31 and 34 kilodalton bands, which are basically the OSP-A and OSP-B, are not in this group. Now, serology testing, of course, has a number of limitations. As I mentioned, Lyme is primarily a clinical diagnosis. A serologic investigation of a person without symptoms is not of particular use, and it has poor positive predictive value. Uh, one of the problems with serology, serologic testing, is that the tests are not well standardized. And that is, if you test a particular blood sample uh, at, at two different sites, two different methods, two different companies, uh, you may get different results. Uh, in other words, there is no international standard uh, for, for testing. And uh, serology also has limited sensitivity as I showed earlier, in the early phase of infection. Uh, and of course, the negative result during that time by no means excludes Lyme disease. Uh, the, the other issue, of course, uh, is the issue of IgM positivity. Um, for example, specific IgM antibodies can be detectable for years after an infection. 
So even though IgM, we think of it as an acute antibody response, it does linger on, especially during Lyme disease, in Lyme disease for many, many years. And uh, a positive IgM is by no means a sign of a, a, an ongoing infection. Um, in other words, the positive IgM finding without clinical symptoms is not an indication for uh, antibiotic treatment by itself. So uh, in the remainder of the time that we have, um, I want to talk about two uh, particular uh, molecules or two particular proteins uh, belonging to the Borrelia burgdorferi spirochetes that are particularly useful for uh, diagnostics. And they are the VLSE and the OSP-C proteins. I'll start with the VLSE protein. This is a protein, by the way, VLSE stands for the variable major protein-like sequence expressed. It's a very long name, which is why I will refer to it as VLSC only. But it is a 35 kilodalton protein that is expressed on the surface of the organism. And it's expressed only when the organism, or primarily when the organism, is in the host, in us, for example, or the vector in the tick. It is not expressed much if you grow the organism in culture. Now, what's really interesting about VLSC is that through recombination, through genetic recombination, during the various stages of Lyme disease, the sequence of this protein keeps changing. It is the only protein of the Borrelia organism that we know of that changes its sequence throughout Lyme disease. And it does this, we believe, to protect itself from elimination by our by the host's immune system. It is a protective mechanism by the organism to escape detection. By changing a sequence, the immune system keeps having to basically keep looking for this, for this protein. Now, what's, what's really also interesting about the VLSC protein is that Lyme disease patients have a very robust IgG antibody response to, to VLSC. And uh, even in the early stage of Lyme disease, there is a pretty robust uh, antibody response to it. And I'll show you some data about this. So this is, uh, for example, a study that was published uh, a, a few years ago um, where two-tiered antibody testing for early and late Lyme was compared to looking at antibodies uh, to the VLSC protein, uh, basically a VLSC band on an immunoblot. And as you can see in this table, uh, if you focus just on the uh, red squares, you will see here that during the acute phase, during the uh, acute phase of the EM stage of Lyme disease, the sensitivity, this is the, the one in the parentheses, is the sensitivity in percentage. Only 5% of the, of the subjects were uh, picked up by using a Western blot, blot uh, using standard CDC criteria, whereas up to 42% were detected if the VLSC band was used. So you can see that the antibody response to VLSC, if detected, uh, can dramatically increase the sensitivity uh, of the serologic assays. It's, of course, also high during the uh, early disseminated Lyme disease, for example, early uh, neurologic Lyme disease or, or carditis. Um, in late Lyme disease, it's not that different from uh, the standard CDC criteria because most of those individuals have a pretty robust antibody response anyway. The, that was a study from uh, Mass General Hospital. This is a second study basically within the same paper um, using uh, subjects from the uh, Westchester Medical Center, and you can see the exact same pattern. Greater sensitivity using antibody response to VLSC compared with looking at the antibody response to the entire organism. And this is, um, I think, a, basically a graph from, from the same study. It's a comparison of what's called the ROC, or receiver operating characteristic. It's a, it's a, it's a curve that's basically used to determine how good 
the performance of a test is. It basically plots the sensitivity of a test against the sensitivity of a test, sensitivity versus specificity. And the more curved this curve is, the better the performance of that test. If it's completely linear, it's completely useless. This one in, in pink or purple is eh, OK. It's, it's got better performance. But this is the one in yellow here, for example, has the best performance. And in this plot of the data from the study that I just showed you, indicates that if CDC IgG bands are used, you have a performance like this, but you get substantial better sensitivity if you also use the VLSC bands. So you basically want to have the best sensitivity and specificity. And here's also some data from, from my lab uh, where we have looked at the immune response to VLSC versus antibody response to the whole lysate of the Borrelia organism through different stages of Lyme disease, starting with single EM, going on to multiple EM, early neurologic, late neurologic, responsive arthritis, and refractory arthritis. And as you can see here, again, the same pattern emerges. You have a certain sensitivity in, in single, Lyme, uh, single EM and, and multiple EM, and you have a much better performance if you use the VLSC antibody. This basically shows the same thing. Basically, in a plot format, uh, these are from, from healthy to single EM all the way to Lyme arthritis. And as you can see, the red shows the whole cell antibody performance. The green shows the VLSC. And as you can see, the sensitivity goes up dramatically during the early stage. It doesn't do much when you get to this point, the late stage. They're about the same. So the uh, benefit is really in the early stage of Lyme disease. The second uh, antigen that uh, we should mention is particularly useful for uh, detection of IgM antibodies, and that protein is the OSC protein. It is the most prominent target of the uh, IgM immune response. Uh, the expression of OSPC is upregulated during uh, the blood feeding by the tick. It basically enables the bacteria to migrate in the tick's salivary glands. And a number of studies have shown that looking for OSPC antibodies has improved performance for IgM detection compared to looking for antibodies against the whole cell lysate of Borrelia. For example, in this study, it was shown that the whole cell lysate has a 36% sensitivity, whereas the OSPC has 46% in EM patients. It also seems to have better specificity. That is, lower number of non-Lyme individuals or uninfected individuals are falsely found to be positive. So there's a lower false positivity rate using the OSPC versus looking for antibodies against the whole proteome of Borrelia. So this was a very quick and very brief um, basics of, of Lyme disease. It didn't go to in a lot of details, but I'd like to summarize here by first uh, Borrelia is caused or Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto is the main genospecies in the U.S., although I did not mention that we do have many different strains of Borrelia burgdorferi in the U.S., and the different strains have been found to be associated with different severity of symptoms. Uh, ticks of, uh, uh, are the main vectors, Ixodes ticks are the main are are the only vectors for Lyme disease in the U.S. And the serology is an important part of diagnostics of Lyme disease. Uh, the two-tier CDC algorithm is still used to guide serologic testing, and of course, knowing about the performance limitations of these serologic tests is extremely important in uh, being able to understand and interpret the results.
uh, there are two proteins that have become particularly useful in the diagnostics of Lyme disease. One is the BLSC. There is a very robust IgG response in all stages of the disease, even in the early stage. And then the OSP-C, which is a, a protein where there is a very strong IgM immune response to it. So uh, this was basically uh, just a, uh, a brief uh, current state of uh, knowledge of, of Lyme disease. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and, and thank you for again for your participation. Also, a big thank you from my side, uh, Dr. Alidini, for this great and very inspiring talk. Yeah, I'm very happy to tell the audience that they are free now to post their questions in, in the chat box if they have questions. I see already people typing questions maybe to bridge the time until it's posted. I can start off with a question. Um, where do you think is, is Lyme disease heading in terms of uh, diagnostics? Is there any developments you, you think that are important to, to be mentioned uh, to this audience? So, so first of all, two, two things, um, which I did not really point out. Um, Lyme disease, the incidence of Lyme disease has been increasing dramatically in the last 20 years. Uh, uh, we didn't show the, the CDC uh, figures, but if, if you go to the CDC website, you'll see, for example, from 2000 to 2015, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of cases of Lyme disease reported. And you can see that on, on the map. So there is an increasing need for, for better diagnostics. Um, what we need uh, for diagnostics of Lyme disease is better detection of early Lyme disease. That's one of the things that I, as I showed you, even with the VLSC protein, even though VLSC gives you much better performance than the previous test, still in the early stage of Lyme disease, it's not perfect. We're still missing uh, many patients uh, because there really hasn't been an immune response uh, generated in the very early stage of Lyme disease. So many patients, even with the VLSC, are not detected. So we need better tests at that time. And, uh, and that's, I think, what's being developed, what people are working on. Uh, there, there are also tests uh, that uh, need to be developed perhaps for de direct detection of the organism. That's another thing that, uh, that different uh, groups are, are working on, basically increasing the sensitivity of, of uh, direct testing uh, for, for the organism. And the other thing, of course, is, you know, which, is, which I did not get into at all, but basically being able to figure out, as some of uh, your listeners are probably aware of, Individu some individuals with Lyme disease go on to have persistent symptoms despite antibiotic treatment. And if we can figure out who will go on to develop these persistent symptoms, we may be able to develop better therapies for those individuals. And again, uh, uh, certain testing, including serologic testing, uh, may help us figure out who those individuals are. So, uh, Dr. Stenshard, I see some questions uh, popping up on my screen. Um, yes, um, please feel free to answer them as you see fit. Please uh, move forward if you if you want to answer the I questions. Actually, I, I see I, two there I as just, well. Um, I see. Um, what are so the I, arthritic symptoms of Lyme disease? Uh, are they are the arthritic symptoms of Lyme disease similar to the symptoms of uh, polymyalgia uh, rheumatica? Uh, yeah, there there may, may be some uh, similarity. Uh, you know, uh, polymyalgia rheumatica is basically an inflammatory disorder that um, is associated primarily with uh, pain and stiffness. And certainly in, in Lyme disease and Lyme arthritis, you can have pain and, and stiffness. So, so in that sense, yes, the, the, there can be uh, some uh, similarity uh, between them. And uh, in the case of, of course, um, uh, PR, polymyalgia aromatica, you, you know, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs are, are, are used. And in the case of antibiotic refractory Lyme arthritis, which again, I did not have time to, to go into, uh, anti-inflammatory agents um, uh, can be used. So, so, so there are some, um, uh, so, some, some similarities there. 
Uh, Dr. Stanshide, if you see any more questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. So uh, one question was about the unmet needs uh, in terms of laboratory diagnostics, which I think you already addressed in, in terms of what is around and uh, the need for uh, more research and advanced markers and potentially also expanding the CDC guidelines. Um, one question, ah, there's another one. Um, is POCT needed or important? Do you have an opinion on this, Dr. Aledini? Uh, I, I think uh, at this point, um, as I mentioned, um, point of care testing is, um, you, you know, Lyme disease remains a, a disease that needs to be diagnosed clinically. Uh, so I, I think that if we can develop very sensitive and specific uh, POCT tests, uh, then I think we're, we're we're in good shape, but we're not there yet. Uh, certainly, there can be uh, point of care testing with the assays that we have now, but they are not at the level of sensitivity and specificity that we want um, to be used without the use of uh, a clinician. Now, certainly, if a in the laboratory, in the office, for example, a doctor's office, a P POCT, that can be very useful, and I think there may be such assays already in development. I don't know if they're commercially available in Europe, but I know that uh, there are several labs working on them. So a second question comes up here. Is EM still considered a positive diagnosis without serological antibody detection? And if so, is the detection of VLSE during the EM acute phase necessary? Yeah, so, so an EM is believed to be diagnostic if it comes along with the characteristic symptoms. That is, EM together with the characteristic symptoms is enough to diagnose uh, Lyme disease. Uh, and a lot of times, of course, when there is EM, there is no antibody um, generated yet. Now, of course, uh, you know, one can test a patient at a later point uh, to confirm that there was Lyme disease because those patients with the EM, even, even in those who might get treated with antibiotics, they may develop antibodies at a later point. Um, but, the, but the answer to, to the question uh, is yes. And the second, I think, was that if so, is the detection of VLS during the EM acute phase necessary? Um, um, I'm trying to, uh, so, so I'm not quite uh, sure what is referred to here. So uh, as far as being necessary, no, it's not necessary for um, diagnosing a patient. That is, VLSC positivity is not necessary for diagnosing a patient. Uh, just having an EM and the characteristic symptoms is enough. All right. I think no one is typing at this moment. Um, I was curious, as we were talking about the ticks, um, there's been some recent developments in, in terms of Povassan virus, uh, also spread by the same ticks, uh, possibly alongside Lyme disease. Are you aware of, of any research to that end or any developments that you think would be worthwhile sharing with the audience? Well, the you know the some some there are there is some overlap in in symptoms uh, or can be um, with the Powassan virus infection and, and Lyme disease, and a lot of the ticks that carry Borrelia also carry uh, the Powassan virus. So uh, an individual can get infected with one or the other, or with both of them at the same time. It's a possibility, and uh, depending on the symptoms and depending on uh, how you know what the physician. Uh, determines uh, the testing uh, can be done. Um, that's that's generally how it's how it's carried out. Um, I don't know if uh, um, uh, maybe you can actually speak, Dr. Stenshide, to to uh, Powassan virus uh, to the testing uh, for that uh, serologic testing. So um, currently, as this was still a, or still is a heavily underdiagnosed disease state, 
um, there is a lack of commercially available test kits, which uh, Euroimmune is, is going to change in the near future. Um, and CDC also issued a number of statements. And just in the recent days, there was two additional confirmed Povassan virus cases, still knowing that this is most certainly heavily underdiagnosed. And um, there's been a little bit of discussion about neuronal manifestations of potential co-infections of Borrelia and uh, Povassan virus potentially transmitted by the same ticks. So um, I think this is a very, very fast developing field of, of research. Um, and I'm very happy that you could uh, share a little bit of your insights to that end. Thank you very, very much. All right. Um, we have um, maybe one last question. Um, it is basically where to obtain samples for research. Dr. Alidini, are you aware of um, commercial sources for samples uh, that can be used? There is no commercial. Uh, there is no commercial source. However, the CDC has basically put out a repository of uh, serum samples uh, that is available. It is supposed to be available to any researcher, and definitely if you have um, federal funding for, for research, uh, you can reach out to them. Um, or, uh, you know, I, I'm, if you can't find it, you can, you can send me an email. I'll be happy to send you, uh, send you the link. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a couple, two, three years ago that they basically um, talked about uh, setting up this serum repository for, uh, for research purposes. And it basically includes uh, serum samples from different stages of Lyme disease as well as uh, possibly from uninfected individuals. That should be available to uh, researchers uh, in the United States. Sorry, I was told I was muted. Sorry. Um, thank you again. I see two big thank yous from the audience. I think um, each and everyone listening in really enjoyed this very, very inspiring and great presentation. At the very end of this presentation, I would like to take uh, two minutes to talk about um, solutions in terms of serology for Lyme disease provided by Euroimmune vets. Basically, a portfolio. Um, with 20 years plus experience in the marketplace and continuous research in the field of Lyme disease. In short, we, we have a comprehensive portfolio in, in terms of ELISA, Western blot, and immunoblots, both uh, aligned with CDC guidelines, but also beyond that, additional monospecific tests, certainly also including uh, VLSE and OSPC, which you have talked about in, in very detail. Thank you very much for that. As the uh, research is a very important field for Euroimmune, and we're certainly always uh, happy to start collaboration and studies to that end, but also in, in general, we've been, for instance, able to create a recombinant OSPC, which has the same serological characteristics as a native OSPC, which is very hard to purify from lysate, but we were able to mimic this, this bond, which will basically lead to a recombinantly expressed OSPC in form of a dimer, which was a huge break breakthrough for us a couple of years ago. And we constantly aim to improve the serology around autoantibody testing for Lyme disease. And as every nowadays laboratory needs to have some automation, at least to some degree, all essays that I just talked about, but also our entire portfolios, is fully automatable to that end. So we have ELISA processing solutions for small, medium-sized labs, as well as big labs with some of our new ELISA autom automation with the highest uh, throughput so far, but also our Western blot solution and Euroline solutions, which is basically our line blots, uh, can be done in a fully automated fashion, sample to result, uh, incubation, and also image acquisition of those strips, which are then consecutively fully automated interpreted. And our entire automation portfolio is connected through middleware to your laboratory information system. We refer to this software as your lab office, which aims to help you with sample management, generation of protocols, 
preparation of final reports, and also the archiving of data. If you're interested in any aspects of this from the reagent sides of things, also the automation perspective, uh, please reach out to our sales force at sales at euroimmune.us. Then last but not least, as I mentioned in the very beginning, this was just the very first one of a series of webinars that we are going to host surrounding uh, infectious diseases and autoimmunity serology. In Q3 and Q4, we are going to host uh, three more webinars on autoimmune nephrology, autoimmune neurology, including disease states like autoimmune encephalitis and perineoplastic syndromes. So stay tuned, check our, our webpage, or send us an email at education at euroimmune.us, and we will keep you posted on the recent updates. And then lastly, um, if you happen to visit one of the following shows, APHL, SCASM, AHCC, AMLI, or ACR, please feel free. You're more than welcome to visit us at our booth uh, and learn more, about more about our, learn more about our projects, and we are always happy to help. With this, again, thank you all so very much, Dr. Ledini, for the great talk, the audience for the commitment today, taking time out of your busy schedule, your questions. I highly appreciate it, and I hope to see some of you back for the webinar.